All right, thank, thank you everyone. This section is about from Rogue One to Rebel Alliance. Any Star Wars fans out here? <laughs> couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I don't believe you. <laughs> couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, when you leave uh, this session, please vote. Uh, there are green cards and red cards. Put it in the bowl, you know, whether you like it or not. That will help the organizers a lot with their feedback. Uh, second point of housekeeping is there's OWASP member lounge uh, downstairs uh, at the end of the uh, hallway of the hall. Um, please consider joining OWAS as a paid member, 50 US dollars a year. That goes a long way for OWAS to uh, organize events like this and support the chapters and projects. Uh, this session speaker is Peter Chesner. He is a contributing editor to DevOps.com and SecurityBoulevard.com. He has more than 25 years of experience in application uh, development and security, leading uh, from developer to leading teams. Uh, he has been writing web applications since 1996. That was a long time ago. And uh, you know, he, has been, he has led his company move from waterfall to agile and finally to DevOps. And he has contributed to uh, these two uh, websites I mentioned as a leader in AppSec space. And if you buy whiskey, he'll tell you more. Thank you. All right, well, that was well covered, so we, we can just wing right through this. Uh, the one thing I want to mention, though, is that I'm, so how many developers in the house? So I do what you do, that's, that's my career. Uh, I come to security from a practitioner standpoint of development uh, as a development leader now, and so I, I have a different perspective than most of the security people that have been mostly security their careers. So. I'm gonna give you that kind of a perspective. So what we're gonna talk about today is something critically important. I'm gonna walk you through why we need it, I'll talk you through how do you build it, and then finally, you know, how do you measure it and, and know that it's actually working? Because I, as an engineer, I love data, and I don't like to do things if I can't tell that they help. So we'll talk about apps for a second here. 90% of breaches come through the application layer. Uh, it's not necessarily our first party applications, right? So we have uh, software that we buy and install on our perimeter, the software that we get for free that we install on our perimeter, there's open source that we include in our applications. All of those things contribute to those attack vectors. It's because as InfoSec, we've done an amazing job of building castles and building perimeters uh, and securing that space. So the easiest vector for them to go at is the one that we haven't defended, and that's applications. Uh, we don't do a good job in that space. And by the way, for technologies that sit on that boundary like a WAF, it's hard to tell whether the interaction that's happening is correct or not because it's meant to take sensitive data in and out of your enterprise. So it goes and gets some very sensitive information and brings it back to that customer. So it's hard to tell whether those actions are correct or not. So that defensive portion is very hard to get correct. All right, so why do I need security champions? I have a CISO. Now, if you, any CISOs in the room? Excellent. So for a typical CISO, they're responsible for everything security, and that doesn't just mean applications. Uh, it's endpoints, it's physical security, uh, it's, you know, what's my DR strategy? Uh, all of those things are part of their job function. So the amount of time they can actually spend in application security is very small, if at all. And so we go to, well, I have an AppSec leader. We'll make it their job. And again, the, the amount of teams, and we're gonna walk through the numbers here, the amount of teams that they have, uh, the number of sheer developers that they have, is incredibly hard to go and wrangle. And if you think about as developers, how many times are you, during the day are you talking about the software that you develop? We have designs. We, we talk about how we might change those because we came up against something that we weren't ready for or that didn't react the way we thought it should. So we are talking about security all the time, I mean, talking about software all the time, but we're not necessarily thinking about security. And we can't pick up the phone and say, hey, can you come down here, we're gonna have a discussion. That thing doesn't work, it doesn't scale the way it needs to. So from a, 
uh, AppSec manager point of view, they have reporting duties, they've got to set the strategy for the company, they need to go off and, and uh, do reporting cross-organization, uh, and there's just too, too much for them to do for them to be in the weeds with, with the development teams. So there are some companies that say, well, hey, I've got Red Team, so we're gonna cover this with Red Team, or we pen test. And while those are great things to do, you can never cover everything. You can't do everything with a pen test. You don't have the time and you don't have the money. Even if you have full-time red team in your building, think of the number of applications you have. How are they gonna get after all of that? Great resource, and in fact, I would use these as the teams become more mature as threat modelers, help the team understand how attackers think. These are excellent, excellent resources to bring in in those early stages of your development. So the numbers game, maybe we could just go hire more people. The gap is growing faster than we can fill it, which means the CISOs in the room walk out today, have a job this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's incredibly <coughs> rare talent for people because, by the way, our universities don't do a good job of preparing us for the real world from a security aspect. Uh, if you're a software developer, they may have a secure coding course, but it's not required. Most of the times, if security is there at all, they talk about network security, which is interesting, but it doesn't help us with this fundamental problem of these numbers. Now, on top of that, we're also moving faster. So you guys have probably heard a lot about this already. So if you look at Waterfall, very large team, very slow team. I've worked on teams of 50, 100 people for you know, a year, year and a half project. Uh, in those kind of scenarios, it's very easy to say, all right, we're gonna cover this with secure code reviews, we're gonna cover this with pen testers. Sure, we can do that at that pace. But as soon as we start to pick up the pace and say, all right, now we're doing Agile, now it's a couple times a month, one or two times a month that we're releasing, and the team has shrunk, and this is really, really important here. When I had 50 more or more people on the team, I could have dedicated DBAs, I could have dedicated security, I could have dedicated front end, uh, you know, middleware, back end people. I, I had the room in the team to do all of that. But if I'm talking six to 12, everyone's got a couple of jobs at least. So cross training becomes really important in those scenarios. Now if we get to DevOps, now we're talking maybe dozens of times a day, at least hundreds of times a year, and that same kind of small team of people. So how do, we, how do we keep up with that pace? So if we're gonna cover that with secure code reviews, if we're gonna cover that with pen testers, if we're gonna cover that with one or two AppSec people, how are we ever gonna get after that problem? So if we look at the Agile process and all of the places that we have that we can talk about the application, the development, when we, we talk about doing our grooming sessions and looking at the acceptance criteria for those, when we're sizing those things before our planning sessions, all of those are great opportunities to have security there in the room, and they're not. They're over here, rubbing on the glass. Uh, I don't understand the process because we haven't talked to them either, so they don't understand how the sausage is made. They're on the outside going, geez, I hope what they deliver is gonna be okay. I know I'm gonna find stuff. So when the application is finally delivered to them, they're gonna find things. Let's say in this case they found 100 things. Now. They know from experience because they've been beaten down enough, you're not getting 100 things out of that team. There's no way. Go to them, they're like, whoa, we want to ship next week. Uh, my VP said it has to go. All right, well, here's 40 things. Well, can we just do the most important ones? I'm like, well, 40 is the most important. We end up getting is about five, maybe. The rest of them sit in backlog or never even make it into backlog. You're fighting for budget, which is a terrible place to be for something that's critical to your business. Now in the highly regulated industries, in the financials, in the healthcare sector, this is less of a problem, though I still find these problems in those sectors, but they know that this stuff is coming. So let's talk about when we test, because as developers, we know there's a better way because we figured this out with Agile. We know if we test earlier that we'll find things that we should be fixing at the right point for lower cost. So if I ask this room to build this jet engine, this 
thousands of parts. It would take us thousands of, of person hours to put this thing together. But we're not going to bought, we're just going to put it all together, <coughs> put it in a test jig and just fire it up. Because that's what we do with application security. Hand it to them, say, here you go. They fire it up and it blows up. Because it always does. And it's going to be something simple like, hey, one of these fins over here had a, had a fracture in it. You couldn't see it with your naked eye, but it had a fracture in it. So when it went up to speed, it blew apart. Now, in DevOps, in Agile, we look for where could I have found that problem? How could I have identified that earlier such that I didn't put all this work in? Because let's say I could have told that after I handed it to him. He like, looks at it and goes, oh, that fin's got a fracture in it. How much work is it to undo all this, to open up the engine and take it apart, all the work we just did to put it together, to go fix that and then put it all together? And by the way, now all my tests that I did along the way for, for functional stuff is useless. i got to redo all of that. The amount of waste in pulling this apart to put it back together is incredible. So we have to look for ways to move it earlier in the cycle to shift left and find it on the loading dock. Could I have x-rayed those parts, found the ones that were fragile, and not use those at all? How much time would that have saved rather than doing this at the end? This is what we do with our application security, and it needs to stop. So we usually find security here. But to do this well and to do this right and to lower our costs, because I'll tell you that in a lot of cases, you can make that cost curve go down to zero. It can cost you nothing because you never wrote it in the first place. So we need to have training, and we need to be thinking about security the whole way. Now, a lot of times, uh, CISOs will have gates, or companies will have check marks, checkpoints, gates that they, that they require. Uh, and I see a couple of different outcomes to them. The most frequent one is this. There's a gate, but there's really nothing stopping me from going around it, so I'm in a hurry. I got to get the product out. This is what I get paid to do. The problem is our goal is that we're paid to ship software fast. And if we're doing that, then we're going to find corners to cut to get that done. Now, in more mature companies that have more rigorous process, it's going to look like this. And neither of these scenarios are good. They're funny, certainly, but they're not good. The, the problem is we're, we're on the same team, development and security. We work for the same company. We get paid to make the company money. And we have to do it securely or else those breaches that you saw previously occur, where in the case of Equifax, half of America, half of the population of the United States, their information is out there now because of a third party problem that was easily remedied. All right, so we now need to look for people that can be in all of those meetings when we're talking about the software that we're building. Where can we find those? The key to this is to use individuals on that team. Now, as an engineering leader, I don't like bus factors of one, so I want to see two people on every team skilled in this, so that way when someone leaves or gets hit by a bus, then I have that backup person and we can continue rolling. But here's the thing. Thank you. I have to wait. Uh, who wants to hazard a guess that the, the one thing that gets in the way the most in application security of making it proceed and getting good outcomes? Either of my CISOs want to take a guess? Anybody? Budget? Budget? Okay, that's an interesting one. Anyone else? Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Excellent. Time. 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 Sorry? Yeah. Lack of time. Yeah, okay. Right. And, and why do we have lack of time? Why do we have to ship it so quickly? Lack of buy. Lack of buy excellent. Mutual accountability. Here's the problem. All the developers are paid to ship the software fast. So what do you think they pay attention to at the end of the day? Get the software out the door because that equals bonus. If we don't change the culture of the company to say security is important and my CISO and my CIO sit next to each other in the room with the CEO and say, you know what? We want to be measured. We want to be accountable for security. It's not security's job for security. It's everybody's job. 
So what if we took that and said, hey, we're going to report at that level? Don't you think that the CIO is going to start looking down the chain at their VPs and their directors and their managers and their individual contributors saying, guess what? It's in all of your goals. If it became part of your goals, do you think you guys would pay more attention to it? All right, so now we've agreed that security is important, that we want to have mutual accountability, and we need to find these people. So now how do we sell this? Well, the great news is, from the CISO perspective, I'm not asking for headcount because the one thing that they hate to hear is I need you know, 10 more people, 12 more people. I, I can't cover this waterfront. I need more. What you're telling the executives is we're going to use existing headcount. We're going to use some of their time, but it's not going to be onerous. I'm going to train them. They are going to get better. And as a result, we are going to get faster as a company. In the teams, they don't have to queue waiting for someone to help them to fix a security vulnerability, to be in their grooming meetings to understand what's the right acceptance criteria for this kind of thing for my story to be successful. So they should go faster because they're not waiting on these people. And for those individuals, I'm, I'm more valuable. I'm not only more valuable here, but I'm more valuable at my next company. And some companies hate for me to say that, but everyone has an end date. You go to a company, it's not a lifetime anymore. This is not how careers are built in the industry. You're going to have a next company, and wouldn't you like to say, I'm a secure developer? Because I have seen secure developers. I have seen people that I put tooling in front of, and we don't find those simple vulnerabilities that everyone else struggles with because they've been taught the right way to do it. All right, so describing the job. Uh, the important thing is here, there's a, there's a lot of things that they're going to be responsible for, and we're going to want to automate our way out of all this stuff because Agile and DevOps. Uh, things like that security grooming. They're in the room listening to the story with everybody else. Hey, that's a new endpoint. Hey, this is a different architecture. Oh, we're touching uh, authentication. Let's talk about security. Third party, bill of materials, open source. Can anyone in the room, besides Vericoders, tell me the, the complete bill of materials for any of the applications that they ship. All of the libraries and open source and stuff. If you can't, then I urge you to go watch a different talk of mine on open source because this is the biggest threat to applications today. For those that are, who's doing microservice architecture? The code that you're shipping today is 80 to 95% made of open source. And if you do what developers typically do, like what I did, you integrate and abandon it, it ages like milk, not wine. So, and when we talk about open source, it's, it's not free like lunch, it's free like a puppy. You get, you know, there's responsibility that comes with that. And we don't take it, we, it just ends up as technical debt. So we need to make them responsible for that. And by the way, when there is a security incident, my product security incident response team, they're the people that I'm gonna go to. Okay, <clears throat> recruiting your team. Who should I get? I love enthusiastic people. That's great. The question you need to ask yourself as a security professional is, are they influential? Because we've all been around those people that are, that are super excited and, and ready to go, and, and again, I love that, but they're not always listened to by the team. If you have a team of more senior people and a more less experienced person starts speaking up about security, it's just shh, shh, the adults are talking. I mean, we, we all do it, we get, we get arrogant in our old age. So you need to find someone that when they say, we need to talk about security, everyone else says, oh, oh hey, let's listen to what he has to say. That is probably the most critical portion of this. Now, I would not turn those people away from learning because we're gonna have training we're going to train those people. Let them train. That's awesome. I, I mean, if I got someone that's interested in security, by all means, come in and learn. But make sure that your designated people are people that can actually have an impact on the behavior of your team. Also, uh, from a don't do point of view, don't overload current jobs. So if you have a product owner and you've got a scrum master, that is not the place for them. They don't need to be conflicted with the duties of a security champion. So you need to exclude those roles and find someone else on that team. They just don't have the time to do all of those things well. Uh, also, 
Don't make it someone that's a new employee or someone new to the team. They need to get the norms, right? They need to understand the company. They need to understand the product. They're already learning so much. To add security champion on top of that when half the time they're really not going to know what they're talking about with regard to the product or its, its architecture, that's not a good fit. Again, let's not dissuade them from taking training, but let's not make that their role. So now we're going to train them. Now in training, we compress this into a couple days of dedicated training time, just to start. And we're going to start with simple things. We're going to start with checklists. If it looks like this, or it's, it barks like that, or it's blue, or it's a Tuesday, then you know, we're going to use static analysis for this. Uh, here are the acceptance criteria you might need if you add in uh, a new security header, or you need to add in a new interface for the user, or a new end service endpoint. Here are the things that I'm going to want to do with that. Uh, so start them off with that. We're going to talk about secure uh, code reviews. And we're going to do simple things. We're not going to say, we expect you to find everything in this source code. But there are certain things that they can be on the look for that we can uptrain them on to get them more experienced. And this will be a process over time. They will get better and better. So we start them simple, and we're going to move them up that chain. We're going to teach them about CIA. Uh, uh, we're going to teach them about trust boundaries and deny by default and all of those good things that, that we know as security people that they just don't. And it's not because they're ignorant, it's just because they haven't been taught yet. So for, from a grooming guidelines point of view, and this is probably the most critical thing for that first year to think about is getting them into that process. Because it, if you think about all of the stories that a team does over the course of a year, you want to make sure that you understand the security implications of all those. So this is a great spot to get high leverage because it's very, very early in the cycle. So if you have a new UI element, new API, if we're changing architectures, uh, if we're touching a security control or creating a new one, uh, forms or actions, maybe a pen test fix that we have to go and do as one of the stories, Let, let's make sure that we understand the security implications of that. If they're touching one of the critical controls, authentication, authorization, crypto, those are places where we don't want to make a mistake. So we might ask our security team to come in, but you need to give them those instructions. Where are the boundaries? What can I do? What do I need you for? OK, so we're going to train them on uh, code reviewing. And just like this picture, so here's our, here's our security guy, we're going to do shoulder surfing. Have them watch you for a little while. Have them go through a couple of code reviews and watch you do what you do and how you do it. Here are the things that I need you to look for. Uh, here's the way I want you to look for it. Keep the, the uh, topics small because we can't give them everything. They're not going to be able to do all that. I always believe that you know, training your team on one thing and then measuring the impact of that is, is critical to effectiveness. Let them practice that for a while. So maybe they're looking for encoding, or they're looking for input validation, or something like that to validate that all that stuff is happening in that code. And then once they watch you, flip. Now you watch them do it. What were you thinking here? Here's this block of code. Uh, we missed this. When you looked at this, did you, what did you see? Uh, understand the way their thought process is, because we want them to get this right. If we can get this balance right, because typically in our AppSec, it's 200 to 1 or worse. So getting these people to get it right is critical. Uh, do spot checks. As you, this is going to be a gradual process where we kind of walk away from this and allow them to take it over for us. So you're going to want to do spot checks on them. And the more experience they get, maybe they can start doing peer reviews of their secure coding. Developers are used to doing that. And by the way, this doesn't need to be a developer. It could be a, a QA. Uh, it could be someone in performance. It needs to be someone that can read code, obviously, uh, but it doesn't have to be a developer. You probably also want to create a test for them, right? Here's what I expect to find in this block of code. Have them go do it, see what they find and what they don't find. Repeat that on a semi-annual basis to make sure that they understand the concepts. Throw some wrinkles at them, see if they catch them. OK, they have to have limits. They are not all powerful. Well, I guess he wasn't all powerful. He died, right? They need to understand that they are being trained to get better, but that the professionals that have been doing it all their careers 
are great at it. So if you see something that crosses a boundary, you're like, I'm not really sure, then please pick up the phone. Please send me an email. Please invite me to the meeting. And by the way, this is the place where our security team needs to be on the ball because if that phone rings and I see it's one of my security champions, I'm picking up the phone. You can't leave them on their own. Say, I've trained you, see you later, good luck. We have to take and invest in their success. So they get to the top of the queue over anybody else because we need to build this out in our teams. I, we work with companies that have three, four, eight thousand applications. Think of how many teams that is. We now have leverage. I now have visibility that I never had before because of these individuals. So don't let them starve. And make it a slow, deliberate trans transition. Here's some more things I'm going to let you go do now. And here's your goal for the next quarter or the next year. Here's what I'm going to train you on. And then when we get good enough at it, then we're going to move on and I'm going to let you do that. Because if we can get this balance right, we can, we can get a whole lot more secure, a whole lot faster. So for our first year, as we're looking at uh, measurements and metrics and you know, what should those goals be, uh, think about getting the, the grooming correct and maybe starting at code reviews. And that might be it, and that's okay. Start small, get some success, get some time back on your plate. And by the way, security teams, measure. Is this being effective? Are we getting the more secure outcomes? Because if we keep testing the way we tested before, and now we've introduced something farther left, what's the impact of that? Am I seeing less cross-site scripting? Am I seeing less SQL injection? Am I getting a better result faster? Because that's the way to sell what you've just done. So make sure you have a baseline and make sure you're looking at those measurements and how much extra time you have to go be strategic now instead of being tactical all the time. Let them be the tacticians. Uh, from a maturity model standpoint, one of the things that we have our teams do is uh, we have a maturity model that we baked. I, we didn't like OpenSIM, we didn't like vSIM. Um, we created something that was custom uh, for us, that made sense to us for the, the kind of goals that, that we wanted to have and the places that we wanted to go. So don't be afraid to do that. And we had the team self-attest. So here are the criteria, and here's where you would slot in the maturity model. You tell me, where are you? Now, based on that, we're going to have, let, well, let's, for the goal for this year, let's get you up one step. Let's get you to that next level. And of course, it's going to get harder and harder the farther up you get, but realize you're going to be starting way down low if you're just starting your AppSec program. So find those things to help train the team. Now, one of the things I always talk about when I talk about training is uh, fill a room with pizza and then open the doors because it will fill with developers. They love free food. So if you feed them, they will come. And by the way, they need to eat anyways, usually. So if we do it during lunch, I'm not really taking any additional time and they see a benefit in it because I got lunch too. So I can talk to them about these things and get them uh, up to speed. Now, one of the other things that we have done is uh, capture the flag exercises. If you teach them how to hack, they're like, whoa, that's really cool. This is awesome, let's go do some more of this. So every week, uh, once a week, we have a meet in the cafe and people bring their laptops and we have a guided exercise. Let's go capture the flag. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there, overthewire.org uh, is one of them, one of the good ones, uh, to just have them think about the attacker's perspective. How do I attack an application? And then once I start doing that, I start thinking defensively. Rewards. They love swag. Uh, a healthcare company I had had those nice uh, thermos bottles, stainless steel bottles, they put security champions on it and gave it out to all their security champions. It should be something that they should be proud of. If you have budget for it, find a way to reward them. Encourage them to go after like a B-Sides conference, go and, and submit somewhere. Go talk about what you're learning as a security champion. That's an important message that everyone wants to hear is how is this stuff done? Take them to conferences like this, or maybe you could take them to RSA one of the larger conferences, the higher up they get, maybe that's part of the reward, is they get to go to these security conferences and talk and see and hear about security in a very, you know, in a very good uh, atmosphere. 
So it's another great way. So uh, there's a lot of ways that you can reward them. So find those and make those happen. Have, have little outings with them. You need to know that, they need to know that you appreciate what they do, that the company appreciates what they do. They're gonna appreciate that through you. For the security people in the room that are gonna build these programs, you need to understand how the sausage is made. There's two kinds of help. Help that helps and help that hurts. And you need to understand whether or not the help that you're giving is going to help or hurt. So be conscious of that, talk to them. Uh, understand the lingo. So, you know, if a, if a CISO ever came up to me and said, hey, I'd love to be a chicken in your next retrospective, I'm like, what, what'd you say? It's, it's getting to that level of understanding the process, the terminology, uh, the tooling, the people, how that stuff is put together that's incredibly em empowering and it makes you want to be in, they want to invite you into the room. Oh yeah, come on in. You can, you can come sit in the back over here. If you haven't read the Phoenix Project, who's read the Phoenix Project? Excellent. If you haven't, it should be on your list. Uh, hopefully next year everyone will have read this. It's, it's a story, not a textbook. So it's like a weekend read. It's very simple. Uh, so that, that's a great place to start to understand the benefits of this process. It benefits of shifting left in security. Uh, write security stories and maybe even write some code. So for the security team, maybe work with those security champions to build some libraries. Maybe we're gonna have our own encoding function, our own validation function. If you live a little while in, in developer's shoes, you'll see that our world is hard too. So doing that stuff and providing that benefit to your company, it's like, if this is broken, it's my problem. Now becomes yet another way for you to leverage your talents into the organization. All right, so in conclusion, this security champions program is not something that we invented. This is something that I have seen in a number of very large enterprises. Uh, it is the only way that we have seen so far to get that kind of leverage and visibility into the applications that are being written every day in our company at the speed that they're being written because it needs to be the people writing the software that are responsible for the security of that software. So let's build them, let's train them. Uh, understand that this is gonna be a, a process. Not everyone is gonna work out. It's like SEALs. You know, not everyone makes it through SEAL training. Uh, there's a washout rate. So understand that. Build this stuff so it can be re-given. Record some of these sessions so that way when a new employee comes on board or you wanna build a new security champion, there's additional resources for them on top of any classroom training that you provide. Hey, you can go back and watch, re-watch this training. Uh, this might be some uh, good stuff for uh, just onboarding a new engineer into a team, understanding the things that that team struggles with and the things that they need to be aware of. So be patient and be an ally. Work together with them. So I will take any questions you have. Yes, sir. Okay, oh, please. Hold on. Um, how do you build a program like this when you have a high employee turnover? I, well, so your company has other problems. <laughs> so that's, you can only do your best, right? I, is, the, is the turnover rate in engineering? Um, it's, a, it's a fictional question. A fictional question, okay. <laughs> I mean, look, I would say that if you have a high turnover rate, then you're gonna have, you have other problems to go solve before you solve this one, but yes. Well, how do you, yeah. So, so making that training reusable, uh, finding more than one, so that way if one person leaves, you still have another one on the team to continue that effort. Uh, th those are all things, building in redundancy. I mean, if you think about failure, how do I prevent failure? Uh, yeah, redundancy would be the first thing that I think of. So maybe you need three in that case, but now you're talking about a whole bigger budget, a lot more time, a lot more people, uh, I would rather focus the company time on fixing the turnover problem in that case. Does that make sense? Who else? Do you have any tips for uh, doing a program in more of a startup, limited resource uh, environment? 
So in a start, so small company. Small company, like 100 employees. Right. So uh, look, Greenfield is 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 great. Small company is great. Uh, you might only you be able to afford only one person uh, to do this training. You may not even have it. Do you even have an AppSec person at this point? It, yeah, it's me. All right. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, look, the, building this in as the company grows and building it into the culture of the company, one of the things that, that, that we take in is security is job one for us. So baking that into the company culture so as new employees come on board, you're not faced with you know, a typical company of 10 to 50,000 people and you're trying to convince everyone security is important. They come in day one, maybe you're part of orientation for the company, say, hey, here's why security is important, here's what we're protecting against. You also have to understand that in a startup, you're going to build a lot on technical debt because you're trying to make sure that you live to the point where you can be cash flow positive. So you are going to have to take more risk. The business is going to have to take more risk. But what you can do is give them good guidance to understand which risks we should take and which risk we might not want to take. Uh, so baking that into the culture and having that part of your training, which is going to be different than a more mature company that really doesn't want to take those risks. I think that's the, the hardest thing for you is to understand where that needle falls as far as uh, what risks to take and what, which ones not to. Hi. Can you elaborate a little bit more about uh, security grooming? I mean, if the champions need to take those topics uh, and uh, guide in, inside the teams or mm -hmm. maybe ask me about, uh, or I get new feature that requires new type of authorization, et cetera. Right. And how to properly measure the progress in security grooming. Okay, uh, so uh, so the question was uh, security grooming. How do how do I really get, bake this into and under, help the developers understand it? So you should become intimate with the kind of stories that they that they have, the kind of application that you have, the kind of architectures that you use. Those are things that are going to be critical to you building that first list. Uh, so you know, are are they building endpoints that are accessible to third parties? Are they uh, what kind of interface do they have? Is it HTML or is it you know through an API? Uh, what kind of things do you want to see and make sure that they test for? What's the tooling that you already have available? Do you have static analysis? Do you have dynamic analysis? Do you have pen testing? What are the options available when I say, here's this story, here's the thing that we're about to do, here are my options. Make it a decision tree, something very simple for them at first, and you can get more nuanced later, but you really want to make it more cut and dry because you don't want mistakes to happen. And in cases where you're not sure and it doesn't fall into any of that decision tree, then they should come and talk to you. And then you should bake that in, build that out, and share that with the rest of the security champions. So you should be meeting regularly with them and they should be sharing stories of, hey, I, I had this problem or I had this, this grooming thing and here's what I did, was that the right thing? Uh, to, to give them the opportunity to get feedback from you and also share some knowledge that you probably didn't have at that time. So it's something that you're going to have to develop over time. It's no different than a product, right? It's going to be small at first and we'll just add to it as we go. Understand that you're going to be more involved at the beginning as you're building out that, those grooming guidelines. I haven't seen one of those before. Let's talk about this. Then you share that with the rest of the team and that becomes part of the culture and part of the onboarding for the next seven champions. Does that make sense? And, sorry, yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, guess what is the best money for value about uh, size of the team? So if you have 20 person in the team that you have to have champion or maybe 50. So what, what is the... The ratio? Uh, so I, I would have, every team should have at least one if not two. Volunteers are great, voluntold is okay. <laughs> but but I want to have two. I need to have some redundancy. People go on vacation. People leave the company. People move to other groups. Um, so you really want to start the program off right. I would have two per team. And that should be sufficient. And, and that it bakes into that team culture of, hey, if we're talking about uh, something that's, that might have security involved, we should bring our security champion to the meeting too. Because a lot of times you're just standing at a whiteboard and you're sketching something out. It's like, oh, yeah, let's go ask Pete what to do. Hey, hey Pete, can you come over here and join us for a couple minutes because I have a security question for you. Uh, but the two is the right number, I think. Okay. <coughs> Any? 
Um, you've mentioned that there should be at least one or two champions per team, but yes. they also should be um, influential, perhaps senior. What if you have a lot of teams, and, but the people volunteering for the championship program are mostly junior or new to the company or both, or basically not very influential? Would you go with this and work with them to uh, gain the position of an influential developer, or would you set some kind of a standard, for example, they have to be a year in a company or gain some experience in order to join the... Right, so there's ideal and then there's reality. Yeah. So if all you're getting and all you can get is junior people that are really excited, hey, that's not the worst world to be in. Uh, I would take what I, what I can get. I would talk to the engineering leadership to say, look, what I, what I need are, are influential people. Take a look at this list. Do I have the right people? I would never turn anyone away from security training. So if that's the best you can do, then let's go there. And like I said, if you're measuring the effectiveness of the program, are they getting turned back? Should there be some support maybe from the scrum master when someone walks by the comment that says we should talk about security and the scrum master should call attention to it and say, no, we need to talk about security because security is important for us. It's up here on the wall. So if it's in your culture, there are other ways to account for the fact that maybe they're not the most influential, but they might be the most knowledgeable. And the more they share that knowledge, the more influence they're going to get. So do a good job of training them before you release them into the wild, and they will gain the respect of, of their peers. Thank you. We tried a similar security champion program in my previous company, okay. but the thing what happened is that uh, not just a security champion, so developers, sometimes their managers or some other people, they discourage the security activities. So eventually they lose the interest to do the security you know, activities they were supposed to do. So yep. don't you, so I have two questions. Don't yeah. you think we should train the senior managers or project managers who are involving in this, pro, uh, you know, this particular development? Yep. And who should be blamed for Security. I, I, I got the idea for rewarding the security champion, yeah, yeah, but yeah. if the program is not working, who should be accountable? All right, excellent question. So let's start with the first one. Should we train the senior executives? We should make them aware. We should help them understand. We should put it in business terms. We should make it cash. But understand that your VPs can't even make their own coffee. So how are they going to help you as, uh, with security champions? Um, the, the failure portion, the part where they're discouraged, <clears throat> I would argue that security is important in that company. I have had AppSec leaders talk to me and say, yes, but I can't get security stories done because features. I said, well, you should probably go find another job because obviously your company doesn't really care about security. So the fact that they're being discouraged from, from participating means that you don't have that mutual accountability model. You have to bake that in. It has to be part of what's important to that company or else don't do it. And I'm not saying every company should do it because some businesses say, we don't care. All right, fine, I don't want to buy product from you, I'm going to go elsewhere. But really, the, the fundamental part is if they don't care, you can't make them. So you know, fighting against 1,000 or 5,000 developers is not a battle you're going to win. If you can't convince the CIO that it's important, then move on. All right. With, <laughs> with that, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pete.